uh, sessions happening in parallel. This session has been curated particularly for policymakers, so we hope it will be very insightful for you. A, a study by the MasterCard Foundation in 2019 uh, projected that uh, we could have 80 million new jobs created on the continent of Africa thanks to the digital economy. So 80 million jobs by 2030 um, thanks to the digital economy. That's a very interesting prospect for all of us here because we know that uh, one of the key responsibilities, one of the key asks uh, from young people is job creation. So this panel today is going to help us round, out, round, round it all up together really well for our policymakers, understand what the digital economy covers, but also understand how we can prepare our young people for it. Before we start and before I invite our moderator of the day, uh, I would like to ask uh, those of you who are seated on uh, second rows uh, to please come forward to the first row. Uh, and then we can leave room to those who are coming in uh, afterwards to join the second rows. Uh, it would be important for the panel to, f to see that the first rows are filled. So kindly asking our partners, please come forward. Um, please come forward and fill the, 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 the spaces in front. It will take a few minutes. Please fill the, the table in front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Mm -hmm. I still see a few spots in the front open. And we have uh, a table that's going to be um, cleared shortly. So please come to the front. Thank you. And as you uh, make your way to the different seats, I'd like to advise you on the program of the day. Uh, as we are running uh, this round table, policy round table uh, in Pavilion 2, we have uh, a session, uh, a plenary that will be running in the main, main auditorium on leapfrogging into the digital economy uh, that will run from uh, about 10.15 to 11.15, following which we will have a session on uh, reimagining Africa's um, creative and culture and creative industry as well as the sports economy. Uh, after that, we will have a lunch break and then we resume uh, our plenary for the closing around 2 p.m. So we invite you to consider joining the different panels as well. Uh, we also are featuring a masterclass from uh, the African Union on uh, mobilization, conversations, advocacy, and partnerships. And uh, that one is particularly for young people, young leaders, to help them be prepared for uh, policy engagement. We also have uh, a very interesting uh, session uh, being led by one of our partners, Rwanda We Want, on uh, Rwanda's journey of um, healing uh, and uh, particularly addressing community and youth-led solutions for mental health in the case of Rwanda, which is uh, a post-conflict uh, society. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming uh, a very esteemed uh, partner, uh, Mr. Leonard Mungarurire, who will be uh, the moderator of our session. Leonard, you're welcome. Thank you, Grace, for the kind and warm introductions. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Hamjambo, uh, bonjour. Um, I hope you're all doing well. 
Uh, my name is uh, Leonard Mungarire, and I'm um, an associate partner with Dalberg Advisors, and I'm honored to be your moderator for this uh, session. This session speaks to the theme of uh, this year's summit, which is accelerating investments in youth, resilient youth, resilient Africa. And for a resilient continent, we must accelerate efforts towards skilling Africa's youth with the requisite digital skills and position them for the future of work within the digital economy. Um, <clears throat> I'm passionate about Africa's digital transformation and youth economic empowerment. Um, I'll also be joined shortly by an esteemed panel of leaders uh, who are doing the hard work of skilling Africa's youth on the continent. But before I welcome them on stage, I wanted to get a sense of who is in the room so the panel can understand um, and speak to the various stakeholders in the room. So by show of hands, how many in the room are below the age of 30 and are youth? I certainly am not youth, so I just want to know how many are under 30? Okay, about roughly about, roughly about 50% of the audience. I'm super excited about that. Um, how many are from the private sector? Excellent. We want private sector to really engage in this discussion. How many in the room are policymakers? Grace said policymakers. Honorable ministers here, development partners there. Excellent. And how many here are in doing any kind of work in the digital economy space? Almost everyone, which explains why you're all here. Um, we all live in an increasingly interconnected world where the digital and other emerging technologies have become an essential part of our everyday lives. How we work, think about the meetings you conduct on Teams and Zoom, how we learn, how your children learn, um, using edtech platforms, using Google and so on and so forth, uh, how we shop, think about Vuba Vuba for those who live in Rwanda or Jumia on the continent, and healthcare. And so, uh, as we think about digital skills, uh, Grace and the organizers asked me to sort of set the framing remarks for a digital economy on the continent before we dive deep into what is required to skill Africa's youth on the continent. And as you all are aware, I'm going to ask um, my colleagues over there to project. I have a few slides just to show a few framing remarks uh, before I invite the panel here. Um, and so the digital economy, as we know, it ha has enabled business models across sectors, including e-commerce, sharing economy, ag tech, ed tech. And in the recent past, we've seen fantastic innovations on the continent, driven by African youth, some of whom are here in the room. And, you know, uh, these include Digifarm, Mcopa, uh, Mpharma. And as a result, there's been a lot of disruption and new business models emerging. Now, what you're seeing here, um, uh, is really uh, a few trends that have shaped Africa's or global digital economy in the recent past and digital transformation in the recent past. A number of trends, uh, including um, global regional events like COVID. COVID changed the way we live, the way we work, the way we engage, the way we shop, and so on and so forth. We have uh, a growing mobile economy, a growing digital economy on the continent. Many African governments are increasingly investing in digital economy policies, are investing in ed tech, are investing in health tech. Uh, many more of Africa's population is, is um, connected to mobile telephony, connected to smartphones, connected to the internet, a lot of investments in broadband infrastructure. And as a result, we're seeing the new business models uh, in the digital economy that I alluded to. Uh, and then we also, unfortunately, have to deal with an ever increasing divide between those who are connected and those who are not connected. Some of the panelists in this room are going to speak to what can be done to bridge that divide. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So to understand the digital economy, I think it's important to look at the digital economy using this simple framework. At the bottom, you have what we call a core digital infrastructure the broadband, the fiber, the connectivity required to power a digital economy. Above it, you have an enabling, an enabling layer, uh, which includes payment systems, ID systems. In many, a few African countries, there is a transition to digital IDs, 
to facilitate payments, to facilitate interoperability, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are the um, um, uh, platforms that connect the infrastructure to mobile apps and services. And then above that, you have the applications and services, the applications that we use in our day-to-day -day lives. And then in the ecosystem, you also have the enablers. And this is where we have um, elements like digital skills, which we're going to talk about, uh, from basic to intermediary to advanced digital skills, uh, policy frameworks. The policy uh, leaders here are going to maybe share a few reflections on what new policies are required to unlock the potential for Africa's digital economy, and most importantly, digital innovation and entrepreneurship. So uh, as we think about digital skills, it's important to think about the larger ecosystem and the framework within which uh, a digital economy should operate. Next slide, please. So with that, here I'm just showing a few African players on the continent that are doing a lot of work, uh, right from infrastructure to enablers, um, and on the enabling bit, uh, the, third, the third piece, the third layer, you have players like M-Pesa, like Flutterwave, like Paystack that are innovating on the continent. And on the application and services layer, you have uh, players like Conga, Jumia, Twigger, uh, Copia, Digifarm, MCopper. So there's a lot of innovators in the digital economy space that are doing amazing work. I just wanted to flag a few. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we think about the digital economy, uh, it's also important to think about what do we need to do as a continent to unlock that potential, to have many more innovators uh, that are going to unlock the potential in the digital economy. So first, how do we leverage the Africa continental free trade area um, that connects all African countries? A few countries have started implementing uh, the agreement. Two, we need investments uh, in education in skills, digital skills, investments in infrastructure. Uh, we also need strong cybersecurity systems to protect our digital assets and to protect our information. And then, <clears throat> next slide please. Here I'm showing uh, a snapshot of um, what is required uh, to equip African youth with the requisite skills for them to be positioned for the future of work. Um, we know that roughly about uh, 10 to 12 million youth get into the job market every year, and only about 3 million jobs are available. So one job for every four African youth that come into the market. What do we do to close that gap, right? Um, a study by IFC recently projected that by 2030, uh, 230 million jobs in Africa will require digital skills, and over 60% of that will be basic digital literacy. In Ghana alone, 8 million jobs will require digital skills. So on your right-hand side, you're seeing uh, the, 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 the gaps and the potential for digital skills uh, on the continent. 230 million jobs on the continent will require some form of skills, whether it's basic, whether it's intermediary, whether it's advanced. And so what do we need to do to close that gap to create opportunities for the youth? We're here to unpack those questions. The final slide I have is a simple slide. If you could please go to the final slide. Shows the kind of skills that are required. And many of the youth in the room, 50% of the youth in the audience, will relate with this slide that speaks about basic, dig basic digital skills. Uh, on the continuum from low intensity to high intensity, we have basic digital skills. These are the skills required for you and I to uh, do mobile money transactions for us to engage uh, socially. And then you have intermediary skills, intermediate skills that are required for you to do your work. And then complex advanced digital skills. Uh, we're going to unpack what this means in terms of creating opportunities for youth, for policymakers, for private sector, and so on and so forth. And to help us, um, just give me a second. So to help us unpack this further, um, please allow me to invite my esteemed, this esteemed panel.
which will provide a few perspectives on how to position African youth, both women and men, girls, for this future of work. They'll also shed light on the type of partnerships required to foster collaboration between public and private sector in the digital economy uh, ecosystem. Um, please uh, help me welcome my the first panelist. Um, her name is uh, Violet Wamutara. As she walks up the stage, um, I'll introduce her briefly. She is a uh, um, She's a former diplomat and uh, committed to Africa's transformation uh, through youth economic empowerment. She's the, currently the Vice President for Africa at Digital Opportunity Trust. Welcome, Violette. I'll then invite uh, Hannah Adams, who's the Country Manager at Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator. Thank you, Hannah. Joining them is uh, Aphrodis Mutangana, who is the Director of Partnerships at Digital Africa. He's also, for many of you who know K-Lab and FabLab, he's the former manager of K-Lab in Rwanda. Thank you, Aphrodis. Uh, I'll also invite Kumud Chandra, who's uh, the Head of Programming for Catholic Relief Services in Rwanda. Welcome, Kumud. Last but not least is uh, Calvin Raul Nangue, who is the strategic advisor ICT skills at Smart Africa. Welcome. So this panel will help us unpack these questions around skilling African youth and positioning them for the future of work. What do we need to do from a government perspective, public perspective, private sector, uh, what should the youth do? I want to engage the youth, I want to engage everybody in the room. Before we do that, we have a short clip just to give us a flavor of what the youth on the continent uh, through the work that DOT is doing on the continent. And uh, after that, I'll delve into the Q&A. Thank you very much. If you could please project the video. That young lady who's gotten support from uh, Digital Opportunity Trust spoke about, and I know the audio wasn't super clear, but she spoke about career change. She spoke about access to digital skills, digital innovation and entrepreneur social entrepreneurship, problem solving, youth engagement, and community development. This is what she's doing through the skills she's acquired through the training and support system from Digital Opportunity Trust. Now, we all know Violet, that um, about 2.9 billion people globally remain unconnected, majority of whom are women. And so the question I have is, how do we reach the millions who are unconnected on the continent, who are the base of the pyramid, that are yet to be connected? And then linked to that question is, what are some of the lessons learned uh, through the work you've done at Digital Opportunity Trust to bridge that gap? And how have you meaningfully engaged women in the digital space and how are you positioning both women and girls um, to be digital champions within the context of digital economy and future of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? So thank you very much. DOT, we are rooted in digital and we are powered by the youth. We all know young people, they are tech savvy. We know they are more connected than ever. But the reality is digital literacy, having digital skills is not a reality for the many. In DOT, we are a connector. We bridge the infrastructure that was presented and the human uh, skills. In Rwanda, we say, Inore niganya ishaki bisubizo, which means youth don't lament, they find solutions. To be able to ensure digital inclusion with the youth in Africa, the youth have to be at the front and center as key engines of digital inclusion in Africa. Through DOT's program, Digital Skills at Scale model, we put the youth in their communities as digital champions. They co-design, responding to their individual needs, locally contextualized curriculums to respond to those needs. They deliver them in local languages, in safe spaces, through peer-to-peer -peer model, very important, through partnership to ensure ownership and sustainability. All the skills initiatives must and should engage women in order to be inclusive and effective. Very important, we must intentionally, deliberately have young women, young girls as leaders, as champions, as role models, as collaborators. What we've seen in our line of work, when you empower young women, young girls, as leaders, community change leaders, digital champions, they automatically become role models and they accelerate inclusion and everything that is required. We've also seen that they build and create solutions that are informed by the challenges that they face. Very important, we need the community members. We need to foster an, in, an inclusive, enabling environment that supports women engagement in the digital economy. We need to engage family members, community members, the peers, to bring them along to learn the ICT benefits in order for them to increase the support that they are giving to the girls. Very important, we need to know that the one-size-fits-all solution does not work given the diverse challenges that the youth have. The young people in the room, all of us, we, are, we have our uniqueness. They all have their unique non-linear journey in terms of their growth. As a result, we also need to be very deliberate, have flexible programs, need-based programming, and a broad-based partnership ecosystem that will support their needs. Youth voices matters, meaning engagement and participation matters. We talked about the two nine billion yet to be connected. We have to be deliberate in co-designing with the digitally excluded young people. We're talking about the people with disabilities. We're talking about young women. We're talking about those in the rural areas. We're talking about those in the underserved uh, location. So very important. We saw the different skills that have to be uh, achieved. But the reality is we need to go beyond those digital skills. They need to be accompanied by the 21st century skills or the human skills. We need critical thinking, we need innovation thinking, we need leadership, we need innovators. We need to cultivate empathy, sensitivity. This will enable the technology to be used in a more inclusive and effective manner. And very important, unique human skills will not be overtaken by machines. Thank you. Very, very powerful. Um, <clears throat> and I think the last remarks that Violet made, you know, one size doesn't fit, it doesn't work. What works in uh, Zimbabwe may not work in uh, Sudan, may not work in Egypt and Tunisia, and therefore a need to design flexible need-based programs. 
Um, and most importantly, as we think about digital skills, we need relevant 21st century skills. As we speak about the fourth industrial revolution, what other additional skills beyond digital skills must, must we foster? Human-centered type skills, we need empathy. And this is a good segue to uh, the work that Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator does, uh, which is an accelerator that helps uh, link skills to jobs. Uh, they do a lot of work on the continent. And I thought that this was a good segue to the work that you do, uh, Hannah, uh, as, as, as you think about the work that Harambe does uh, with regards to skilling for a digital economy. Um, how have you gone about that practically? And can you share one or two examples on the continent? Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you, Leonard. And thanks, everyone, for spending your Saturday morning with us. Um, as Leonard mentioned, Harambe Youth Employment Accelerate works on bridging the skills gap between young people and the jobs on the market. And our entire focus is being demand-led, which means coordinating very closely with the private sector and employers to ensure that we're skilling young people with the skills that are in demand on the market. In, the ter in terms of digital economy, one of the things that we've learned, which Violet also touched on, is that you cannot just skill for digital skills and expect a young person to thrive in this new world of work and this new economy. Um, one of the sectors that we spent a lot of time working in is the global business services sector, which includes any job that's digitally enabled where a young person does the job in Rwanda, but they may support or work for a client in the US, in Europe, in Asia, or somewhere else in Africa. And two key additional skill sets have come out of uh, that work that we've identified as being necessary in addition to the digital skills. The first is a really high level of spoken English. Uh, so more and more, as we all know, these jobs involve working outside of your country or local context or working with clients or customers uh, internationally and being able to clearly communicate and work with, with your colleagues or with your customers in English is really key. And the second skill has been uh, what we call workplace behaviors, which I think is often taken for granted or overlooked by private sector employers, uh, it, but it includes everything from punctuality uh, to how to work with your colleagues to professional communication. And looking at the job holistically and what it requires has been really the key to our success in ensuring that young people are ready uh, to win and compete for these jobs on the market. So one key example that uh, we've worked on here in Rwanda is we've partnered with digital scaling institutions. So one of our partners is called Solve It Africa. And we co-created a three-month uh, training program where cohorts of 100 people go through this training program. They are provided with technical skills from Solve It. And then Harambi provides English acceleration as well as these soft skills, these workplace behavior skills. And at the end of the program, they're ready to win jobs in the international market with employers that are coming into Rwanda and setting up. And so we think this is key to building the digital economy and bringing more jobs uh, into Rwanda, into any, uh, any country in Africa, is to thinking about this job not just as a unique digital skill set, but a holistic skill set that needs to be addressed and solved for. Thanks. Just checking, can you all hear us very well? OK. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, I had two things. Uh, one, that in, as part of the training that you're curating, uh, you, you focus on language and communication skills. You also focus on other critical skills that are important for the workplace, including punctuality, including professionalism. And as, are you, as you co-create these programs, uh, you integrate uh, other skills to build a digital economy. And I think it's, it's a theme that I had Violet uh, allude to. It's a theme that I've had you mention and a good segue again to uh, Catholic Relief Service. As I come to you, uh, Kumud, I think um, I'd like to hear about the work that Catholic Relief Services is doing, you know, given the digital divide that Violet spoke about earlier and the divide on the continent. What is Catholic Relief Services uh, doing to ensure that African youth, especially those in the rural areas, that they are not left behind. And then, um, uh, what are some of those success stories? You're a large international NGO with a huge reach. How do you bridge that gap on the continent? And what, what role can you play to really contribute to a more systemic change with regards to a digital economy on the continent? 
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, Catholic Relief Services is present across 100 countries around the globe. 75% of what we do and um, the participants that in our projects are on the African continent. So I think there is um, capacity and there is a possibility for us to achieve scale and take some of the really good work that we've heard here already on the panel and that's being done around, um, around Rwanda, around other countries, learn and take them to scale. Here in Rwanda, for example, um, we heard, and across the continent, we've heard how um, there is this digital tide that is taking over, and yet it is not reaching everywhere. The rural youth, the rural young people still remain um, mostly not yet connected to this digital tide. So, and often that does not take for Sorry, often that it does not take a lot for us to connect them to it. So what, 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 are C, what is CRS trying to do? So um, one, it's to make sure that they have access to some of the initiatives and the information that is already out there in the ecosystem. It's just not reaching the young people. Uh, sometimes it's about making sure they have that information. That information does not get to them because they don't, they don't have access to smart devices, but other times it's because they don't speak English or they don't speak French. So making sure that information is at their fingertips, it's, it's at their doorsteps in languages that they understand. Um, and then where initiatives and opportunities don't yet exist for those rural young people, creating them and modifying them so that they fit the very specific needs of rural young people um, in, uh, that we're targeting. And um, that cannot happen without us first understanding what those specific needs are. So at CRS, we understand what their specific needs are. We design, we create solutions with young people at the forefront and the center of what we do. Uh, and we make sure that the solutions that we're putting together uh, work for them. This is not just through digital, we do this across our initiatives, whether it's nutrition, whether it's WASH, whether it's food security. So it's a way of doing things and we think that there is value in bringing the same um, methodology to, uh, to digital entrepreneurship, to digital employment, to digital upskilling um, on the continent. And then, uh, the other thing that we heard of was skills and support. And so I think another, another piece that CRS is already doing here in Rwanda and other parts of the world is uh, providing entrepreneurship, but also jobs, but also daily life skills for young people, how to, how to, um, how to be at a job interview, how to write a CV, just very basic skills that are not yet reaching young people in rural, uh, rural contexts. And so from a digital perspective, we are planning to roll out an initiative called Youth for Youth, where young people are, going, are creating digital solutions uh, for other young people, particularly rural young entrepreneurs, in Rwanda. And we realize that um, digital solutions are the future, but they're not yet the present for a lot of the young people that we are targeting. And so those digital solutions will be um, coupled and complemented by in-person solutions using existing, uh, using, ex we don't want to create anything new. And there are, there's lots of good work already being done. There's a digital ambassadors that we can leverage. There are uh, private service providers who provide business development services that CRS has created that can be leveraged as well. So this model of complementing digital and non-digital support for rural young entrepreneurs while working at the bottom of the pyramid that Leonard spoke about, the digital infrastructure piece. So participating and catalyzing this, um, these ecosystems to make sure some of the key pieces around uh, smartphone or smart device access, around connectivity, around affordability of data can be worked upon and bringing the right actors to the table. That is the tri tripartite model that we're trying to, uh, that, that we're going to be rolling out um, in Rwanda. And in terms of scale, I mentioned how we, we're present in over 100 countries. Um, we're planning to target 5 million youth in the years to come across, uh, across the countries that we work with. We have networks of Caritas agencies agencies in every country that we work with that have that themselves have uh, grassroots community networks and ones that we can leverage and use to reach more young people with the solutions that are created um, and I think with the with our global reach we're able to create innovate test um, succeed or fail 
modify, and then take those initiatives to scale. So while what works in Rwanda might not necessarily work in Mali, maybe one part of what works in Rwanda can be tested, modified for a Malian context, and then CRS, because of its global presence, is able to take that to a different context, and that's how we think we can reach scale. Take the good work and take it, um, take it all over the world, starting with the African continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I had a number of very important points there, access to information and in language that youth understand. Uh, and the question there remains, how, right? So maybe it's a question we're going to unpack there after we open it up for, for Q&A. How do you ensure that information is accessed by youth in the rural areas, especially in the context of not having devices, right? Um, and then second thing is, Catholic Relief Services, um, you know, seeks to understand the root causes, to also understand the needs, and as you design for programs, skills for entrepreneurship, you, 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 you combine non-digital skills and digital skills, uh, focusing on entrepreneurship, focusing on the grassroots community. Which brings me to a question I want to bring to uh, Digital Africa. Because of the reach and scale of Catholic Relief Services across the continent, Digital Africa is also an Africa-centric organization. Uh, Afro, as a French-based organization with the aim of supporting tech entrepreneurs, again, linking to the entrepreneurship element that Kumud raised, um, what is Digital Africa doing to equip African youth, not just in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas with the right skills Violet spoke about skills, Hannah spoke about skills and bridging the gaps that exist. But what practically is Digital Africa doing um, uh, differently? And would you share with us a few examples about what uh, Digital Africa is doing to equip startups with not just the right skill sets, but also startup financing? Yeah, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, um, so uh, Digital Africa is a... Uh, is an initiative launched in 2018 to support uh, tech entrepreneurs on the continent. And uh, we are based in France. And uh, we focus on three things. First, uh, the, the first thing is to equip uh, tech startups with, with the right skills. Second one, it's access to finance. The third one, we do recommendations and, uh, and, uh, and uh, recommendations to policies because we are not supporting entrepreneurs when the environment is not conducive. Um, so to, to respond to your questions, when, when it comes to skills, we started, like as I said, we, we focus on tech startups. Those startups are go that are going to provide solutions to, 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 to people. What we did first, uh, we, we, last year in partnership with the, the JZ, what we did, we did a research first to see what are the skills missing among the startups, tech startups. Then after what we created, we, 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 what we did was to, 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 to after like finding the, the, the missing skills, we, we offered uh, 280 scholarships to different, to, to different people in 11 countries. And after, after training those people, we are going to equip those startups who are going to, 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 to impact their communities, to, to impact the, their communities. As I said, they, they, to, to respond to your, quest, to, to your second question about investment, so we try to understand what are the real needs of the people. I'm going to give like, when it comes to access to finance, two, two examples of the financing facilities or method we are using. In tw you know, in 2020, we are like in COVID. And many of the startups, you know, were not able to continue to work. We launched a bridge fund where we said we are going to support uh, startups that were hit by COVID. And uh, we put in place a 5 million fund uh, to, 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 to invest in startups. Uh, and the ticket size, the tic investment ticket size are 175,000 to 600,000. And as we are speaking now, uh, we've invested in more than 11 uh, startups and we had the chance three of them have paid back, you know. So those the, the one of the example. The second one, it's based on data we had. I, if you read the report when it comes to investment in Africa, uh, last year, uh, the report said that startups on the continent raised $5.2 billion on the continent. And guess what? 80% of that money went in four countries, like Kenya, South Africa, Egypt, and Nigeria. And 
what I'm going to say here, I don't have facts and evidences, but you, you can imagine 50%, 50 countries of Africa shared 20%. I bet that out of that 20%, 67 to 80% went again in English-speaking countries. So how about French-speaking countries? So we launched um, this last, sorry, last month a fund of 6.5 million again to focus on French-speaking countries and with the small tickets which is like 20,000 and 30,000 on ideation MVP level, so that we can even help those who are starting. And for the moment, it's operating in five countries, Morocco, Tunisia, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and, and, uh, and Rwanda. And we are launching it in other countries beginning of 2023. So this is to show that we, what we are doing, yes, we are contributing to entrepreneurship through supporting the private sector and to prepare the future unicorns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Three things I heard that Digital Africa focuses on, skills, finance, and enabling a conducive policy environment for um, startups to thrive. Uh, the examples you gave around where VC money is going to startups, I think the numbers you gave are pretty much accurate because when you also double click those numbers, you. you the VC money is going to large um, economies like Egypt, it's going to Nigeria, it's going to Kenya, it's going to South Africa, right? And the reason is simple. In many of these countries, uh, startups are ready, right? Uh, they are far more sophisticated. But in many of the other African countries, uh, including Rwanda, there's no robust pipeline of startups. Startups are not ready. And you've done a lot of work in the startup scene, uh, Afro, you'll attest to the fact that now is when they're starting to be ready so they can be able to attract um, the billions of dollars available to get them get to growth stage and, and beyond. Um, the final speaker is from Smart Africa, and as you all know, Smart Africa really seeks to um, accelerate the creation of a single digital market uh, on the continent. They're doing a lot of work, um, including developing blueprints. For example, the digital economy blueprint that Kenya is leading, the Smart, smart City blueprint that Rwanda is leading, um, uh, the, education, uh, the education blueprint that uh, is also led by another country. And so a question to you, um, uh, Calvin, and as you've listened to all the speakers, um, it would be good to get a perspective from a continental level, from a smart Africa perspective, with regards to um, uh, what is required uh, to accelerate digital transformation on the continent, from a digital skills policy perspective, from a finance perspective, uh, from a digital divide perspective, what are you doing, what are the gaps, and what should the people in the room also uh, be aware of moving forward? Thank you. And thank you very much for <coughs> this opportunity to speak on, on behalf of Smart Africa. We welcome this. So Smart Africa is actually a 34 member states, strong alliance of uh, countries who have in common the, to transform their digital economy through uh, ICTs. And these countries are actually embarked in the alliance as a, you know, as a, in a form of, uh, you know, project building process, meaning that we have projects at the Smart Africa Alliance that we support at each country, and the countries champions the project, which has something to do with the digital transformation agenda. So currently we embark on 32 projects uh, in Smart Africa, and each of the projects follows the same approach. First, we move from a concept note, then we get to the blueprint development, and we go into the piloting, and finally the scaling at the continent phase. So one of these projects is the ICT in education and capacity blueprint we have developed. It was championed by the Republic of Burkina Faso, and it was carried out during the pandemic. You can imagine how challenging it was, but it was successfully done. So what does the blueprint do? It actually uh, provides a benchmark of successful initiatives on the continent, but actually transforming the educational system. Then it leverages on the challenges the country have had, and it groups them into five categories of countries. Now, each of these groups has countries facing the, ch the same challenge or even having the same 
level of development in terms of ICT uh, in education development. So, so after this uh, blueprint, uh, I mean, this uh, study that was carried out, we formulated 26 recommendations for each of the clusters of countries. And these recommendations range from policy to infrastructure, strategies in terms of discourse school transformation, and teachers training, skills development, in all. And currently we are in the phase of taking these recommendations to the member states individually to dissect it and see how it matches their ecosystem. Then we bring together all the local players of the digital skills development at the country level. TVET, higher education, primary, secondary education, Ministry of Labor and Ministry of ICT. So having done these workshops, we identified strategic pilots, projects we can support in the coming year to actually implement based on the blueprint recommendation. So this is one of the things we've done and it's quite successful because we're able to address typically the challenges countries are facing knowing that they are not all equal. But we end up seeing countries in the same cluster that have practically the same level of development. Like just take like the cluster A where we see countries like Kenya, South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, that all are facing similar challenges. The second thing we've done at Smart Africa was to build the, to put the concept of the Smart Africa Digital Academy. It's actually a Pan-African vehicle that aims to bring together and federate initiatives that are on continents addressing digital skills development, supporting if required, or replicating, or even scaling those that are proven to be successful. We do this across five different domains of intervention, starting from the top layer where we have policy and decision makers. Then we've got the second layer and the third layer that concerns the youth where we have advanced ICT skills development and at least uh, ICT skills for entrepreneurs, uh, professionals, and young people. And then at the layer two, we have the STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, advocacy, in schools, and then at the bottom layer, that's the bottom pyramid where we have the digital literacy for all. We have launched SADA in five countries, successfully implemented in seven, and we aim to reach all the 54 member states of the continent by 2030. So this is what we are doing, and thank you for giving the floor. Thank you very much, Calvin. Uh, I think another round of applause for the panelists. <clears throat> Calvin ended on a very positive note, which is the work that Smart Africa is doing on the continent. The design of the blueprint and taking it to member state level to align, to validate, to align with ministries in charge of education, labor, ICT. I'm hearing a lot of coordination with policymakers, with private sector, with the youth. Um, and then the other important thing is the digital academy that they have set up to really bridge uh, the gaps with, and also accelerate digital skilling programs. Uh, and everything he said in many ways touches on everything that each of the panelists uh, did mention earlier. I'll now open it up for uh, the audience to engage and um, uh, just a few house rules. Uh, if you do raise your hand, a mic will be brought to you. Uh, kindly introduce yourself. Uh, tell us where you're from, the country you're from, and I'll take a first round of questions, first maybe three to five questions, and then I'll distribute them across the panelists. So I'll encourage and invite my fellow speakers to note down the questions that you think resonate most with you that you want to address. I'll help you walk through the questions. I'll start with the ministers in the room. Um, uh, I'll give them the floor. Uh, Minister, if you don't mind, please uh, tell us where you're from and... Uh, uh, thank you, moderator. My name is Vera Kantukuli. I'm the Minister of Labor in Malawi. And thank you so much, all our panelists, for your uh, well-versed uh, uh, contributions. But I, I think mine would be probably a comment or a question. I wanted to, number one, say that uh, the future is digital. I think it has been made very clear from the presentations from our, our, um, our panelists. However, what I want to say, especially to the young people that are in this room, is that the future is not a place. Every single day we are already in our future. 
from yesterday, today to today, we are in our future already. So there's no bell that is going to be rung to say, now young people, you are in the future. Every single day that God in his infinite mercies has been so kind enough to have given you, you have entered into your future. So it, is, it matters therefore what we are doing now to ensure that we are leveraging on the tech space so that we can move our, our lives forward. Having said that, the first thing that I wanted to say was, we need to demystify um, uh, technology ensuring that we're leaving no one behind and that even those ones that never went to school should be able to access it. Connected to that is that we need to create mechanisms for upskilling and reskilling of young people to ensure that we are making them ready for jobs in the tech space. And what that means is that if you talk about, like Malawi, 76% of our, of our population is under the age of 35. And the larger part of that, they, are not, they have not been to school or they are school dropouts. But how do we ensure that we are bringing them along? Which means, therefore, we have to also um, incorporate issues of informal skills development. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, how do we ensure that we are, we are incorporating informal skills development within the space of technology so that even the young people that have never been to school or that have dropped out of school but still need to be incorporated within th these programs are incorporated accordingly. I think that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister from Malawi. Uh, thank you so much for your reflections and, and, and questions. I'll take uh, if there's another minister, uh, let me know, put up your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, now, the youth that make up 50% of this audience, minister said 60% of youth in her country, we all know that 60% of population on the continent com is comprised of youth. So, I'll start with the lady here and then the gentleman behind. If the mic can be brought to the lady here in front. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am not sure I still qualify as youth, but uh, great. I am called Anna Nizima. I'm the country director for Digital Opportunity Trust in Tanzania. So it's a privilege to see my VP speak um, over there. So I have a few things um, to contribute towards the conversation, having worked in the digital space for quite some time now. Um, you know, and, and I'm happy that we have uh, policymakers in the room. Based on my experience, um, I do feel that universal access to the web needs to be considered as a public service. Similar to health, similar to education, it's that simple. It should be a public service. And that's the only way we will eliminate the inequities that are already backed in our societies. I'll speak to you know, a country like Tanzania where most of the young people will come up and say, hey, we're not homogeneous creatures. As a country, we still are going through the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions all at the same time. While we're speaking about the metaverse and blockchain and cryptocurrency, there's still villages that are yet to be connected um, on the internet. And those that are connected, we still are yet to see the infrastructure when it comes to um, the actual devices. So investments need not to be um, left to the development partners, but also really government uh, being so, uh, uh, what, is, what is it, intentional in terms of investing in this. Um, I'll also say that um, I've been privileged to have a look at many programs and strategies of development partners, and very few of them I yet have incorporated an element of digital. So you look at even post-COVID, the development partners' strategies are still leapfrogging to integrate ICT in them. Very pronounced development partners. So if we have large funding from the development partners, say investing in the agriculture space with young people, if we don't integrate ICT in that to speak about how do we accelerate agribusinesses through technology, then that investment is very old-fashioned pre-COVID. Post-COVID, we need to be looking into these things, meaningful investments that are looking into um, ICT. I will then take this to other partners. So we do speak about this when we meet in panels and plenaries, but I do feel that each country needs to be at the heart of creating communities of practice around digital. Now, these community of practice might um, include development partners, the government, the private sector coming together 
periodically, every quarter, not when we are waiting for the Youth Connect Summit, to speak to best practices and what could be scaled, where does DOT meet Vodacom, who is a broadband or internet provider to reach out to a woman not connected in Kigoma? These are conversations we need to be having on a continuous basis. Now I'll take it back to the young people. So there's, a, <laughs> there's, there's, there's what we call the uh, metacognition or self-guided learning. There's a lot of opportunities that are being offered already. But when I look at the young people's appetite to actually do self-guided learning, the skills we're talking about, there's many platforms that are also offering them for free. And even the youth that are literate enough to go online, the appetite is not there yet to do self-guided learning. So whether that's backed into how we were raised so that education is more directed but an instructor, um, this is something we need to look at. So finally, if our moderator uh, say something, um, it's on the freelancing and uh, so the opportunities in freelancing and the digital economy, uh, which you know, have led to this buzzword called the great resignation, where young people are very afraid of the rising costs of living as well as the high rates of unemployment and they are resigning to entrepreneurship. So most of these young people are actually necessity-based entrepreneurs, not opportunity-based entrepreneurs. So, 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 so there's something here that we need to be looking at. Now, I guess also, now, how do we create safe spaces for women online, which is also one of the biggest challenges. We are pushing, pushing, pushing this digital shift overnight but yet young women still don't feel that they are safe online, so there's things that need to be worked on, whether it's also capacity to build their resilience to be online, or the investment in protection policies that actually are protecting these young women when they get to be online. Not just young women, even older women. Thank you. Thank you, Nisima. Gentleman behind. Thank you so much. I'm Sam Maskili from Malawi. I'm one of the youth in uh, this room. Um, I co-founded a startup, Inspire Learn. We basically simplify access to e-learning for the most marginalized uh, using feature phones. Um, I'm, I also co-founded another startup called Computer Clinic that works at um, IT uh, training for the youth in Malawi. So, I have a question that is in two parts. Um, the first one is about the uh, digital divide. I come from a country uh, with a youthful population, uh, but also where 44% of the population lacks the foundational skills to participate or leverage on any digital technologies or any services. Um, I would like to ask, what are some of the steps we could take to be ready for the next world crisis, learning from the one we're coming from, where over 420,000 secondary school learners were left without an alternative learning mechanism uh, in the villages of Malawi. That's the first question. The, the last question I have is about the digital gender divide, where as we're in this room speaking, a lot of women, young girls, are not active in this space. What are some of the policies we can put in place for most African uh, countries to empower but also motivate women and the young ladies to take active roles in the digital era? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just pass on the mic to the lady on this table? I'll come back to you with the next round. Yes. Good morning. I'm Rachel Chen from UNDP Uganda. I'm the Youth and Innovation Program Associate. Um, my question is around the digital skilling. Are our institutions ready to equip and churn out the relevant labor out there that needs 
the current changing market needs. A lot of our institutions, especially in Uganda where I come from, are still using curricula from as back as 20 years ago, and that's supposed to serve uh, the current generation and the current digital trends. And no one finds that uh, wrong in any way. We feel like we can still proceed and make a difference while maintaining this static curricula as as policymakers, institutional leaders here, what are we doing to create um, that change? Then my second question is around how can we change the perception of innovation and tech? A lot of people think that innovation and tech is simply a smartphone, create another app. We have so many apps that people are not even using and, and how are we as governments or institutions also enabling policy reviews around innovation, intellectual property rights for creators. There's a lot of gaps in there. I would really like uh, our dear panelists to speak into those issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a, a, a youth student at the, at the back, a lady. Uh, please tell us where you're from and your question. Um, thank you very much. My name's are Muhizanina Trina. Uh, I'm a high school student from Rivera High School, it's right next year. So uh, my question goes, it's, it's, more, it's not a question, it's more like a suggestion. So you see in, in Brandon High Schools, right, when we've reached like, you know, L levels, we're taught to pick three subjects, all combination. And ICT is like an option. It's not, it's not compulsory. We have compulsory subjects like English, like general studies, but ICT is not an option. And you, you came here and told us the future is digital, right? So if the future is digital and ICT is only an option, is the future an option too? Like, <laughs> like um, <laughs> most of us high schoolers, when we get the chance to like use our computers, I don't, Personally, I want to be like, let me go see how Microsoft works. Let me go see how I do a presentation. I'm going to run to things like YouTube, Instagram, because I don't get that enough. But if ICT is compulsory, like if, if um, IT, um, how do you call it? IT education, right, is compulsory, then the future is compulsory. Then we're all ready and resilient enough to face the challenges. That's suggestion number one. So another uh, question is, <coughs> if we all know the future is digital, it's computer-based, will that not uh, lead to a high rate of unemployment? Like the, the, the people in the rural areas, like you said, who want to get access to that? Because you keep saying in the future, and um, a minister said that we're in the future already, and they already don't have access to that. So let's say, let me give an example of a, of a large farm, right? Like a farm of animals, plants, things like that. So if they, being, if they bring those tractors, then the, um, the number of people who are supposed to be working there is going to reduce, meaning there are many unemployed people out on the streets, leading to a high crime rate. Because if not employed, you're idle, meaning you, have, you don't have anything else to do. So you result into crime, right? So what are you going to do to solve that unemployment rate? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't catch your name. I just heard you're from Riviera High School. Thank you. My name's are Nina Trina. Nina Trina. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll start with those questions, and I think uh, we'll start with uh, Nina's, which really triggered a lot of uh, thought-provoking comments and perspectives, and I, I, I wish the ministers were still in the room uh, to give perspectives there. But if indeed the future is digital, uh, ICT should be made compulsory. The competence-based curriculum that most African countries are using the education systems in many ways have incorporated um, ICT as, as <clears throat> a compulsory subject. Uh, I was recently watching an online event. It was a prayer breakfast, and somebody on the panel said that in China, for example, TikTok content, which is highly regulated, is education focused. It's to do with how the Chinese um, uh, Great Wall of China was built, how to build an, an airplane. It's mostly STEM related content. And that Chinese students in high school, uh, when they get out to the job market five years, 10 years, 
20 years from now, they'll be far ahead compared to our kids in our generation here because what are they doing on, on TikTok, for example? You can imagine what is being done, uh, what, what, what kids are watching on YouTube, what they're watching um, uh, on TikTok and other online platforms. But your point is well taken. I'll ask, um, I think this question uh, on, 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 on uh, shifting the curriculum that the lady from Uganda um, uh, mentioned shifting the curriculum and changing the perception of innovation, technology, IP, as well as Nina's question is a question that maybe Calvin could help um, answer uh, from a continental uh, level. What could be done as you think about the blueprints uh, moving forward? Um, and the question from the entrepreneur in Malawi on the digital divide, digital gender divide, what policies, foundational skills, it's, it's something that I think that Violette could speak about and complemented by Catholic Relief Services. Um, DOT Tanzania, your comments were mostly uh, reflections. Uh, I, I, I like all the reflections on you know, gig economy, freelancing, what opportunities are there. But I think it's a question that Hannah could help address because you are really addressing uh, that critical piece. Uh, and then uh, the Ministry of Labor Minister from Malawi spoke about the future of digital and demystifying technology, creating mechanisms for upskilling and reskilling. Um, I'd, I'll invite Afro to speak about it. So I'll start with you, Calvin. Over to you. And as you maybe go through these questions, since we don't have time and you have to go to the other panels, I'll ask that you end with your parting shot. Thank you for, for this question. It is a very good one. And uh, let me start with the question of why the curriculum is static. You know, and I feel that COVID-19 came in as, a, as an eye-opener for most governments in Africa. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Because education transformation was a priority when we... Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you for, for changing this. So we came across, across this problem during the blueprint development. It was one of the primary challenge, curriculum review across the educational sector. We discovered that ICT curriculum was very outdated. It was about 15 to 20 years outdated. Whereas technology is a fast-paced industry, we know that changes, innovation happens practically on a daily basis. Content being created, being shared, actually come from the out, outside, uh, outside part of the continent. But there's practically nothing done from the continent perspective. And I, and, I, and I just can say thank you to COVID for just bringing this fast acceleration of the digital transformation of our educational system. Because so many things have happened on the continent within the space of two or three months after COVID started. We saw the uprising of digital platforms. Uh, a lot of schools embarked on content, content uh, adoption, number one, teachers training, uh, and, and towards it at a very fast pace as well. And we've seen that a lot of policies are currently being reviewed. And the AU just brought in recently the ICT, I mean the ICT in education, uh, digital strategy for 2020, uh, up to 2025. And it's an emergency that we need to address these challenges today. So believe me, some changes are taking place uh, at national levels, and the blueprint we have revealed has one of the key components, and I'm just going to address the question from Uganda, facilitating policy dialogue around innovation, how to regulate the ed tech industry to ensure that all these solutions cr that are created, both on the continent and outside, are quickly adopted at the, uh, the country level. And there's also the national strategy for ICT in education in some countries that are being currently developed and being supported by Smart Africa. So I assume that some of the challenges you've experienced here already are documented in the blueprint, and there are so many successful pilot projects that have been carried out outside the continent, 
and even in some advanced countries within the continent that are bound to be replicated as a, as a response to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Calvin. I think I'll pass on the mic to Violet. Can you hear me? Okay. The Honorable Minister mentioned the future is now. What that means is for us to, to relearn, to unlearn, and to learn again, to really be lifelong, lifelong learners. When you're thinking about leaving no one behind, it means bringing everybody along. And we're talking about bridging the gender digital divide. It's very important. When you talk about for women, you have to say by women with women. For women, by women, with women. Very important to put them at the front and center. Same to the youth. We need to look at for the youth, by youth, and with youth. And my challenge to our colleague in Malawi, we have amazing young people in Malawi who are tech savvy, who are more connected than ever. And it's a challenge to you, the challenge we had from the beginning of this summit for the youth to take the seat at the table and really to go out and make the impact. In terms of my parting shots, really we have to invest in youth initiatives. Trust that when youth access capital, they will invest it back in our communities. Our commitment in DOT, uh, in the next three years, we are committed to deliver digital skills and 21st century skills to more than one million by the year 2025 in the African countries that we work in and in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Hannah, on uh, gig economy, freelancing, what skills are required to upskill, to reskill? Yeah, thanks. I think it's a great question. Um, it's great to hear the context for the work in Tanzania. Um, I, I think my overarching idea around this, and specific, specifically around the self-guided learning that you feel like young people are not motivated by, is we as practitioners um, need to do a better job of providing a compelling narrative for how a young person can go through a skilling um, initiative and have an opportunity at the end of it. So I don't think it's that young people aren't motivated by self-guided learning. I think it's that they're recognizing that they don't really believe that if I do the self-guided learning on an app that I'm really gonna get a job at the end of it. So that's really on us as um, organizations that deliver interventions to ensure that we have the demand at the end of an intervention or a self-guided learning opportunity uh, to make sure that young people can really succeed um, and to, to deliver on that promise. Um, in terms of my, my parting shot, I think it's been mentioned a lot by, by young people in the audience, especially Nina back there. Um, we won't be able to deliver at the scale that we need to if we don't filter back down to education institutions. That's secondary schools, TFEDs, tertiary education institutions. There needs to be more coordination with the private sector in terms of what are the skills that are in demand um, and these these conversations need to happen on a more regular basis. Education institutions need to be more nimble, and organizations up here need to really work to facilitate those conversations. Um, that should be happening more regularly. So I think when we all come back here in a year, you guys should hold us accountable to that commitment. Thank you very much, Hannah. Afro, and then Kumud. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to, 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 to comment on few, if you allow, like I'll take a few minutes. Uh, and to finish my short, like my last word, I will speak it in French. So take like the translators for those who don't understand French. Um, so to start, like the, there is a comment minister made. How do we make sure that uh, we bring the informal? I think the response is we have to start at early age. I remember when I started teaching kids of six years old how to use a computer. It was really something, uh, 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 something that you know, you know that. From six years, the kid is touching the computer. At the age of 10 or 11 or 12 or 13, whenever he leaves or he drops out or she drops out, she knows the, like, how the computer thinks. So it was my comment. Um, the, 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 the second, there is something a, a, a young guy from Malawi talked about of, uh, of gender divide. I remember when we started the school of coding in refugee camps. I started, we started with 48% of girls after one month, we were at 
you know and i think what we need to do is to make sure that uh, to, to to make sure that we are like giving something which is really like customized for them and to me the, the 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 last one is that we have to be inclusive to make sure that the government is in the government is is the, the government is involved the private se sector is involved dfis are involved and uh, investors so to finish to finish what i wanted to say like the last word it's a challenge for ourselves uh c'est une histoire pour les gens qui connaissent l'histoire uh the the the, 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 the foot football um c'était c'est l'équipe de Burkina Faso. Une fois, ils jouaient avec une équipe très 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 simple, très simple. Et l'équipe en question a battu Burkina Faso. Et vous vous savez comment les 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 fans de foot ils sont comme des fous. Ils, ils ont voulu brûler les maisons des des footballeurs, des trucs pareils. Mais ils ont dit avant de faire ça, on va demander à Thomas Sankara qu'est-ce qu'il pense. Vous savez ce qu'il a dit quand ils ils, ils, ils sont arrivés. À, le, le, le Sankara, il a dit, si le Burkina Faso d'aujourd'hui a perdu, c'est pas à nous la faute. La faute est à ceux d'hier qui n'ont pas pu préparer l'équipe qui devait gagner aujourd'hui. Mais si le Burkina Faso de demain perd, c'est à nous d'aujourd'hui qui n'aurions pas pu préparer l'équipe qui devrait gagner demain. Merci. Last word. Yeah, thank you. So maybe. Um to the question on digital gender divide, um, to the young man from Malawi, I, I think we need to understand again across, across the continent what are the root causes of this digital gender divide. Depending on the country, depending on the context, the reasons, the root causes are different. We need to understand the different barriers that young women are facing uh, to, to bridge this gender divide. It could be policy. If it's policies that are not friendly to young people, then the policymakers that are here, uh, the correct stakeholders, governments, uh, need to get together to fix those policies. If it's cost, similar, the private sector and the public sector need to work together to ensure that costs, uh, costs of um, smartphone access or digital um, devices are affordable for young women. And if it's attitudes, if it's linked to uh, knowledge and attitudes and practices, then we need to work on social behavior change. We need to work with communities themselves and create awareness, remove barriers um, at the community level to, uh, um, to allow young women to bridge, um, bridge this digital divide. So I think it, it needs to be a deferring uh, response depending on where the con what the context tells us. Um, I think my parting shot would be that after hearing what everybody has said, we cannot just do one of these things. We need to do everything at the same time. It's a lofty task, but I think we need to make sure that the young people in high schools are getting compulsory IT education so they're, rest, so they're ready for tomorrow. But then those who are already, who are dropouts from school or who never went to school, we're able to demystify it, as the Honorable Minister said, demystify technology for them today. So offering them informal or semi-formal opportunities to upskill, whether it be from a technological perspective or using technology for other skills that they need to, uh, to, to succeed. And um, I think my last parting shot of my parting shot would be that nothing uh, can work till we don't work on that bottom of the pyramid, which is the digital infrastructure. Uh, we need to make sure that um, that digital devices, digital connectivity, they are accessible, they're affordable, and that they work for everybody depending on what their needs are. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I think I'll pick it up from there, uh, working on digital infrastructure and fixing those gaps. I think uh, the county director from DOT Tanzania, you did allude to the, to the fact that um, uh, broadband infrastructure should become a public good, a public service. I could not agree more. And I think even though the Broadband Commission, country governments, Smart Africa is doing a lot to mobilize investments from private sector, from development partners to invest more in broadband infrastructure, I think the onus is on, yes, policymakers and private sector to roll up their sleeves, invest more for more equitable access. Uh, because after all, it's a universal um, uh, um, uh, requirement now, and you know, it should be a basic human right uh, now. I, and I know you're 
your, your point was more of a perspective. But if I was to sum up everything that we've listened today from the audience, from the youth, from private sector folks, from um, uh, our esteemed panelists, one is that um, digital transformation on the continent has in the recent past seen an acceleration owing to changes in the environment, the first being COVID, and that many more countries are at a point, a casping point, where they are revising their digital economy policies, their ICT policies, policymakers in the room, ministers will attest to that. Many more are adapting digital economy. Um, uh, the hybrid learning in schools was, if you will, a trigger for governments to rethink how education is delivered. Number two is that all of us should remain lifelong learners. As we, as we adapt, as we adopt new technologies, we need to, you know, be open-minded to relearning, to unlearning, to uh, relearning, and also learning new concepts. There's something that I thought was important uh, when Youth Connect was being officially opened. The Deputy President from Kenya uh, did say that youth from age 18 to 25 should claim their place, should not wait for opportunities to be handed to them. And I think the panelists here did allude to that again, that uh, the future is now, the future of digital is now, and that um, the entrepreneur from Malawi, as you design more apps and services, how do you continue to you know, rethink and innovate and disrupt how you're offering these solutions uh, to people who are not connected? Uh, how do you, as you think about um, e-learning e solutions to those that are using feature phones, how many more can you connect beyond Malawi you know, uh, to the rest of Southern Africa and all of Africa in the next five to 10 years as you think about scaling? What opportunities and uh, what partnerships should you forge with folks on the table here? Get to know them after this, folks in the audience as well. The third thing that I had is that we need more coordination with the private sector, um, uh, which, is, which is important for, 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 for uh, curriculum to be aligned to needs from the private sector. As, as things change, as the digital economy takes center stage, how do policymakers continue to engage at roundtables with uh, policymakers to redesign curriculum and to rethink uh, curriculum? Um, the point that Afro made about planning, thinking how, or, or learning skills about how the computer thinks, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, these are no longer strange concepts, but concepts that should be embraced now uh, at high school level and, and beyond. I didn't quite get the analogy you gave of football. I'll let you summarize that in English because I don't speak French. And then the last point is that um, we need to really have a grasp of root causes that underpin the digital divide, that cause um, the gaps. Um, how do we engage more with the policymakers? How do we also change our behaviors as we adapt uh, to the digital economy? How do we involve the private sector? Um, and I think what struck me the most is that we must do everything at the same time. Everything is a priority right now. Uh, the digital economy is important, but we need to also think about the digital economy as a disruptor for other sectors in agriculture, in health, in finance, in um, logistics, in transport. It's both a sector as it is an enabler. And how do we um, develop policies that harness the potential of digital as a sector in itself, but also as an enabler and a disruptor in other sectors? And the need for us to um, upskill and reskill. So I don't think I, I, I could really aptly summarize everything this esteemed panel uh, discussed and what we also heard from the audience. Um, I will leave it at that. And please join me in thanking the esteemed panelists for their. And thank you to the Honorable Ministers, thank you to Smart Africa, thank you to Youth Connect Africa, to the youth that are leading this event, to Grace and team, and to Cube that is managing this behind the scenes. We are grateful to you. Thank you. Have a rest of a good morning.